Knowing what kit you'll need for certain disciplines can be as difficult as the discipline itself. So in this video today, we're gonna to break down all of the kit that you will need as a beginner and as an intermediate and beyond as a hybrid athlete. Hello everyone and welcome to another video and welcome to one of the most requested videos I've actually ever had on this channel which is what kit do I need to get started in all of these disciplines. So for those of you that might not be aware I'm Fergus Crawley and I practice as a hybrid athlete as I'm currently balancing strength work alongside extreme triathlon work. If you want a bit more context on myself as an individual and the things that I've achieved and practiced as a hybrid athlete over the years, then please do just go back in the channel and make sure that you have subscribed down below, as that way you can form an opinion for yourselves. Nonetheless, what I'm going to do today, first of all, is ask if at any stage you do enjoy the video, you drop it a like, reiterate that I would like you to subscribe, and please do comment with any suggestions, thoughts or feelings as we go. But as we go, what I'm going to be doing is breaking down the very, very bare minimum for running, for the bike, for swimming, for triathlon and for lifting, and then go into the nice to haves and the more advanced for all of those elements and then round off with a bit of an overview of a few other things from a lifestyle perspective that we can work in. For context, this is all the stuff that I use on a regular basis as a hybrid athlete and a lot of the brands that you'll see here today I work directly with. So there'll be discount codes available for you to use in the link in the description or on the screen at any point. All the brands that I work with directly are products and brands that I use on a regular basis anyway. So win-win for me and win-win for you as if you see anything that you think I need one of those there should probably be a discount code for you to make use of. If not then sorry but I've done my best. So without any further ado why don't we crack on with the bare minimum entry point for running. Okay so let's get into the absolute basics the entry point for those of you that are wanting to get into running on a regular basis. First thing you're going to need is a pair of running shoes. I'm not gonna give out any recommendations on running shoes as I rotate an awful lot of them, whether I'm wearing Vivos day to day, whether I'm wearing Vivo trails on shorter trail runs, ultras for my sort of longer runs, or Saucony's with carbon plates if I'm doing any sort of triathlon tempo specific stuff. Ultimately, find what works for you and stick with them. Next up, you're gonna need some running clothes. This here is the Gymshark Speed Range, which I wear pretty much all of the time for my running. You can wear old pajama tops that you got when you survived Niagara Falls if you want to. You just need some clothes to run in. Not very complex. I don't need to insult your intelligence, but what I do recommend is getting some shorts if you are on the larger side, if you are a hybrid, then having some inner lining will be very useful to prevent the inner lining of the skin between your thighs from having a bad time. I think wherever you are in the world, it will benefit from Having a cap available to you as well, just to protect you from the sun slash regulate temperature a little bit and a bit swaggy if you want to put it on backwards as well. Always nice to consider. And I think if you are training as a hybrid, you should be following a structured program, which means that having access to a sport watch for data management on your wrist as you're running will be very useful. This is the Garmin Phoenix 7X. It has all the features in the world, but I think in terms of basic requirements, Smartwatch, set of running shoes, running clothes, and a cap is all you are going to need. So if you're looking to work in some time on the bike, whether that's because you're working towards your first triathlon or whether it's because you just want some aerobic work or some hill sprints or something like that, you are going to need, spoiler alert, a bike. So this is a sophisticated piece of kit. This is the Cervelo Caledonia 5. If you want a full debrief on the arrival of this bike, head to this video here. But you don't need a bike as sophisticated as this to get started. This is simply my road bike, which I do my daily miles in. I'm on the tri bike for more advanced, more specific stuff. But if you have something on two wheels that can allow you to travel, then get comfortable on it, get used to it, and you can start getting some really good work in. You probably want to avoid a BMX, but other than that, if it's got two wheels, give it a go. Or if you're doing a lot of work on a C2 bike, a Watt bike, then crack on, but avoid spin bikes as they don't really mimic real cycling at all. But what kit are you gonna need for the bike on top of a bike? 
you're going to need a noggin protector, better known as a helmet. And trust me, at some point in your bike riding career, whether it's today, tomorrow, six months in the future, six years from now, you will fall off. So having one of these is imperative for the sake of the integrity of your ability to continue to exist as a alive human being. So if that didn't scare you, then this will. No, I'm joking. Well, I'm not joking. You were probably terrified at this point, but what's even scarier is how filthy these glasses are, given that I'm filming a YouTube video. But nonetheless, these are there to protect your eyes rather than to do anything other than just make you look like a bit of a dork out on the roads. But these are stopping bugs, dirt, grime going into your eyes. And obviously, if you want those to be sunglasses because of a fair weather day like today, then make them sunglasses. But either way, I think whatever level you are, you should try and protect your eyes. My road bike and tri bike both have clip-in pedals. The dirt is, is optional. Again, I was riding these this morning, so please don't. I mean, it's all dry dirt. This is obviously old dirt, but nonetheless. If you have clip-in pedals, then wear cycling-specific shoes. If you don't, and you've just got flat pedals, then as a beginner, if you just want to get some work in, then by all means, you don't need specific kit for that. Just crack on with whatever shoes you are comfortable in. Next up, I highly, highly recommend some bib shorts because they have chamois padding, which will make it much more comfortable, protect your arse and backside area, and just allow you to do more miles, be more comfortable, and understand your positioning on the bike better. These are from Hoob, and the fitting of Hoob for those with slightly larger than average road cyclist thighs is fantastic. And the raw sex appeal from having bib shorts on is <laughs> undeniable. Alongside that, having a cycling jersey, I'd say is fairly essential. Again, this is from Hoob. And the main benefit of having a cycling jersey rather than just being in a t-shirt means that you can store your phone, your gels, any food, your keys in the back without needing pockets. So yes, there's a lot of specialist cycling kit out there, but there's a lot of really low hanging fruits for practicality, like just having a pair of bib shorts and a bib jersey to go together so that your ride is more comfortable and practical. So let's move on to the swimming requirements. Swimming is gonna be one of the least demanding disciplines that we run through today. But to start with, all you're gonna need is a pair of jammers, a swim cap, which is probably still optional, but I would advise wearing one just so you get used to it, and a pair of goggles. That's it. That's all you really need to get started in a swimming pool. Let's move on to some triathlon considerations if that is the direction you're wanting to go down. So if you're wanting to work towards a triathlon, there is some kit that you're just not gonna be able to get away with not having. Luckily, you can do all of these things on a budget, but for sake of argument, let's just work with what I've got here. So a tri suit is just gonna make your life a lot easier in triathlon, and it's just a very practical bit of kit to have. Like with the bib shorts, you've got some chamois here, but ultimately you can run in this as well. So for those that don't know, the tri suit forms your base in a triathlon. You wear it under your wetsuit, you then take your wetsuit off, and then this is your base for the bike and the run. Again, you've got some pockets in the back to store stuff in. It's very light, it's very fast, but ultimately a lot of triathlons, you will be better off having these, whether it's your first or whether it's your 50th. Next up, most triathlons will mandate that you have a race belt to display your race number, as I have shown here. So this is my one from the Kelman, which I actually haven't taken apart just yet, but you're gonna need one of these if you do commit to a triathlon. You're not gonna need to train in it, but it's definitely not something you want to forget because you will have to display your number on the bike and on the run nine times out of 10 in most races. So making sure that you've got one box off if you are committed to a triathlon is essential. Then one of the bigger expenses alongside the bike, if you are committing to a triathlon that is wetsuit mandatory is, funnily enough, a wetsuit. So this is the Hoob Varmin, which has done me a whole world of good and hasn't been properly cleaned after my lock and swim. Please ignore that. I'm very underprepared in terms of cleanliness and hygiene for this video. I do apologize. But this is one of Hoob's most buoyant wetsuits, which means that it's got a three, five, buoyancy ratio and some really decent buoyancy panels in the thighs, which means that if you're not that confident a swimmer, getting a wetsuit that is catered to your swimming style will be useful. That's where Hoob are really fantastic, so please do head to the link in the description and there is a discount code for you to explore if you are looking to grab anything from them. But a wetsuit is something to consider and do make sure that it fits properly. You want it to be tight without it being restrictive so that no water's flowing through it. But if you commit to a triathlon and it's got a wetsuit swim, you're gonna need a wetsuit. And more importantly, you're gonna need it in training ahead of time so you can get used to how it feels. 
If you are using a wetsuit, I would say it's essential that you have some form of a lubrication to stop the chafing on your neck that comes with it. This is just very easy to use. Hoob, lube, it's also a fantastic pun, so I think they should get your business just for that alone. But if you just apply it to the areas where you find yourself chafing in a wetsuit, you'll make your journey to your first triathlon, second triathlon, third triathlon, whatever it may be, that much more comfortable in doing so. So that is all the basics across running, bike, swimming, triathlon. I'm now going to cover the basics for lifting before we run into the nice-to-haves for everything else. And what are the requirements for some basic lifting as a hybrid athlete, might you ask? Well, you're looking at it, I reply. So a t-shirt, some shorts, some socks, and some shoes. This is the Gymshark and Steve Cook collab, but it's very similarly available in the Geo range. These are five-inch speed shorts. These are a pair of crew socks. And these are a pair of Vivo Barefoot Primus Lights in collaboration with Finisterre. And that is where I do come onto my one other recommendation other than having clothes and a gym membership to get into lifting as a hybrid athlete is a pair of flat shoes. So you'll see a lot of people going into the gym with big spongy running trainers on or really narrow sort of trainers which don't allow their feet to do their natural thing and allow you to grip into the floor and sort of spread your feet in. And that's ultimately not allowing you to make the most of your biomechanics and really get used to movement patterns. So having an open toe box, flat pair of shoes, I think is something really recommended. Cost effective and really long lasting. As you can see, these Primus lights are very well worn from Vivo Barefoot. I've had these for four years almost now, and I still lift almost exclusively in these. So if you do want to grab yourself some, Fergus 10 for 10% off, and I do recommend them because having the flat sole means you can really engage with the floor, you can feel your way through the movements, there's no interference between you and the floor, which means that you're learning the movement patterns as you will be doing them over the rest of your hybrid athlete journey. So starting from the ground up, building that foundation, and moving forwards with a clear understanding of how you're moving is very important. Let's for a moment pretend we're on a Silicon Valley Zoom call. There's about 15 people on the Zoom. People have got their backgrounds blurred. There's a bit of small talk going on. And then somebody hits you with the, okay, let's circle back. And here we are, back at running. But this time we're gonna run through some of the nice-to-haves or the more advanced things that you can consider if you're wanting to level up your kit list as a hybrid athlete. So first up, if you're data-driven and you're wanting to really understand your heart rate and all the data around your running, upgrading to one of these to pair with your smartwatch is wise because it just means it's closest to your heart, which means it's the closest degree of accuracy, which means that you're getting the best data and making the most informed decisions on your training moving forwards. Now we're moving into the world of mechanical doping, where you might want to purchase yourself a pair of carbon-plated shoes. The technology exists, it makes you faster, it makes you feel faster, it reduces your perception of fatigue, so these do have a place in your training. I use them for sort of 1500 meters and above on a track, or sort of tempo work or tempo reps or stuff like that. I'm not in them that often, but I do have access to them, and I like having a bit of a drop in my training shoe when I'm coming off the bike in triathlon, because my calves and my Achilles do take a bit of a battering from being in zero drop shoes with Vivo most of the time. So obviously there's a whole load of options out here. Hoka, Saucony, Nike have a whole range. So ultimately whatever feels most comfortable to you and fits within your budget, but carbon shoes are not cheap. Then if you are working stuff in on trails or you're working in ultra distances and need access to convenient ways of getting hydration, fluids and food on board, as well as storing gloves, beanies, waterproof jackets, whatever it might be, then having a trail bag is a great option. This is an Osprey Duro 6. I also have the Duro 15 and I use both of them religiously. If you go back in my YouTube videos, you'll see I've used this for years and years and years. I've got access to hydration on my shoulder. I can put soft flask in here. I can have food ready to go there. Phone in there, GoPro in there. I think there's even some, that's all rubbish. There's no food in there. Sorry, I was gonna offer you some Straub's Campbell, but there aren't any. As well as that, you can fit some sort of specialist kit that you might need as you go. So I don't actually have any to hand, but things like waterproofs, things like waterproof trousers, all the specialist running kit that you might need, depending on what environment you're in, might be a nice level up for your kit list. So let's move on to the more sophisticated part of the bike upgrades. Fair warning, this is where things can get quite expensive quite fast, but hopefully I'm gonna break things down so that you can make the informed decisions at home as to where you decide to spend your hard earned money. So one upgrade you can make from a bog standard road bike or whatever you've started doing your cycling work on is to a more sophisticated road bike or to a triathlon bike, or in this case, the bat bike. 
So you can obviously upgrade from a road bike to a tri bike. It doesn't need to look quite as mental as this one does. It can have a back seat post if you would like it to, but that is a considerable change that you can make because the most single aerodynamic efficient change we can make is putting a pair of tri bars on. So one option that's a bit more cost effective, you can upgrade your headset on a road bike to put some tri bars on and that is the best of both worlds in many ways. Next option is the tech that you have access to. So a bike computer is a really, really good bit of kit to have access to because it gives you your power if you've got a power meter, which we'll come on to. It gives you your heart rate, it gives you your distance, it gives you your average pace. So it gives you live feedback right in front of you, which can inform your training give you more data to work with in real time and ultimately allows your training to be more efficient. Again, considerable expense, but something that's worth having. Next up is something that I think a lot of people actually spend money on sooner than they necessarily need to, which is a power meter. So here, this crank for me functions as a power meter, which gives me feedback on power up here. And then I work within power zones whilst I'm out on my ride. But I got away with my first sort of two, three years of triathlon training without one as I worked within heart rate zones and perceived effort zones. And given that power meters are quite pricey, I think people can get away with, I mean, unless you've got the money to burn, I think you can get away with not having a power meter and investing in one of these instead and getting a lot more bang for your buck that way. If you obviously want to invest, you know triathlons are something you're going to be doing for a long time, or you're just out on the road all the time on your bike, then please do invest in one. But I think it's something that people spend too much money on too soon, and the amount of athletes I've had conversations with that think, oh, am I going to need a power meter? Well, not necessarily. So that's another upgrade you can make, but not one that's entirely essential until you get to a certain point. Then with tri bikes or with road bikes, you have optional add-ons for storage, and that comes in all shapes and sizes. This bike has some built into it, but that is ultimately why tri bikes are tri bikes, is because they are designed for you to be as effective as possible in a triathlon. So it has this bento box here, which allows me to store gels in. I've got a bottle cage at the back here, which allows me to store bottles in it. I've got this here, which is an aero bottle, which was a sort of off the shelf upgrade. I then have access to storage for like kit, salt tablets, CO2 canisters. And then down here, I have access to a whole load of maintenance stuff. So those are all inbuilt into the bike. But whether you're on a road bike, whether you're on a tri bike, you can purchase little pouches that go on the back, pouches that go under the frame set, or ultimately adjustments to your bike set up to allow you to get more out of it. So there's lots of little add-ons that you can grab that are going to make your bike more efficient for the type of training that you're doing. In the same vein, you can upgrade the hydration system. So this is not part of Cervelo's offering. This is from Profile Design, and this just sits on my aero bars to allow me to have hydration on the move. This is a considerable expense for what it is, but it's very, very handy for me. But again, I got away with sort of, not racing competitively, but enjoying triathlons for a few years before I decided to take the plunge on one of these. But again, whatever setup you are riding on, there are options out there that will allow you to upgrade your hydration system, which might mean that you're more efficient, you can get more fluids on board, and might make you a faster athlete, or might just make your training that much more practical and enjoyable. Then we get into the world of chaos, which is upgrades that you can make to your bike. So things like upgraded wheels, these are NV Foundation 65s, these are not stock with this bike. This is a disc wheel, this is an NV SES disc, which is just obnoxiously fantastic, but also very fast and comfortable to ride. So you don't need any of these things, but ultimately it's up to you at this point where you invest into upgrading your bike. For example, I have DI2 electric gears on here, which failed me for the first time at the weekend just gone. But electric gearing is a considerable expense as an upgrade to a bike, but you can make it if you want to. So in no way an essential purchase, as some road bike forums online might make it seem, but something that you can consider once you get to a certain level beyond the basics that we've already covered, and then you can decide where you spend your money on your bike. Another upgrade you can make is getting rid of the previous noggin protector and replacing it with an aerodynamic one, which Blackbox have very kindly provided for me. Full face visor, which has saved my eyes once already this year from a rather brutal crash that I had. Ultimately, the big downside to these is that the ventilation is almost non-existent. You get quite warm in these, but they are more aerodynamic, which over the course of 180K, 200K can make a big difference. So something to consider, again, depending on what level of training you are at. Then we get into the nitty gritty where you can add on specialist bits of kit, things like overshoes, arm warmers, leg warmers, longer bib shorts, but that all kind of depends on the climate that you're in. So I'm not gonna show you what arm warmers and leg warmers look like, but I'm gonna say that these things are out there and they exist. And ultimately 
dressed to the climate and there's lots of accessories out there for you. But again, this is where you can get into the real, real death by detail. And let's avoid me sitting here wasting all of our time by holding up an arm warmer saying, this is an arm warmer. Last thing I'm gonna cover is small upgrades you can make from a mechanical point of view, just to make your life a bit easier. So things like, that is a tubeless tire repair kit. So I've got tubeless tires, which means that the sealant in them should repair any puncture that I have out on the road by itself. So if that hole gets too big and I need to seal it, this will fix that and hopefully allow me to keep riding. And then I will use CO2 canisters and a cracker to pump my tire back up. So this is just a faster, more efficient way of repumping your tires if you're out on the bike. So again, there's lots of small details that you can read up on and spend money on ultimately to make things a little bit more practical, a little bit more seamless. And this is where we're getting into detail like using fast elastic laces on your trainers and things, which is not a level of detail I want to go in today. But there's mechanical things on the bike that you can use that make your life easier when your life has been made difficult by things like a puncture. So why don't we move on to the advanced swimming kit and see where we end up. A disclaimer, every single element of this next section as we cover the nice to haves in the swimming category are made of neoprene. So first up is a pair of buoyancy shorts which have some buoyancy panels in the thighs and pick your hips up as a wetsuit would. So if you are racing in a wetsuit and you want to train more like it feels when you're in the wetsuit, then a pair of these for specific sessions might be a useful upgrade. I've had this pair for ages now. I use them fairly frequently and I love them. As somebody with heavier legs than your average swimmer, they come in very handy. Next up, we have a whole load of additional neoprene accessories, which are basically there to allow you to continue to train when open water gets a little bit chillier. So neoprene gloves, neoprene booties and a neoprene swim cap just give you those extra layers of warmth that allow you to keep open water swimming if you so desire over the winter months so that you can maintain your stroke, maintain the feeling or just get in the cold water and feel alive like I like to do a K a week over the winter, regrettably. So that's it. Those are the swimming nice to haves that I use on a regular basis. Let's cover the gym nice to haves that I use on a regular basis. Okay, so if you're looking to level up your lifting performance as a hybrid athlete and you're wondering what the kit list might look like, well, here's a few things to consider. First up, if you have limited ankle mobility or just feel like you need a little bit more in your heels to get full range of motion or to be comfortable, a pair of Olympic lifting shoes might be a good investment. And yes, everyone, don't be jealous. These are the OG Addy Powers from circa 2010 when they were discontinued. I use these for front squats, safety bar squats, and any Olympic lifting, just to give me that little bit more in my heels and to, yeah, give me that base from the floor, which allows me to execute the movement more efficiently. And in an exciting turn of events, Fergus reveals his long-standing color-coordinated pair of knee sleeves, which, given that you see him speaking about himself in the third person, strangely, wearing these most of the time, you're probably thinking, wow, there's a layer of vanity to Fergus that we haven't really explored on this YouTube channel. And yes, the illusion seems to have crumbled, but nonetheless, knee sleeves are fantastic because they give you a bit of warmth around your knee, which is great for injury prevention as well as proprioceptive feedback. And whilst these are also made of neoprene, I'm drowning in neoprene here. Ironic, because neoprene helps you not drown. So poor choice of words, Fergus, but we move on. These are really good for making you feel stronger. So you can't store any elastic energy in here because they're made of neoprene but myself and thousands of other people online will testify to the fact that you feel stronger, feel more of a rebound at the bottom in a pair of these. And ultimately they allow for more longevity and sustainability when lifting because it just gives you that extra layer of warmth and protection around the knee. In the same vein, here is a pair of wrist wraps that I've had for almost 10 years as well. Sadly, a few weeks ago, I did lose the thumb loop. So they're on their way out, but these have lasted me a very long time. These allow you to just really hold and reinforce a solid wrist position, whether that's low bar squatting, whether that's bench pressing, whether that's working with dumbbells, and just allows for, again, that sustainability, that longevity, and a layer of injury prevention, but more importantly, rigid positioning if you're pushing top end weights. So again, optional, nice to have if you're sort of looking at real top end strength, something I'd recommend because it just allows a better understanding of your position. But if you're just a recreational lifter, Focusing on hypertrophy, not something that you need by any means. Next up, we have a pair of lifting straps, and these are Olympic lifting straps just because I've always found them easier to use. 
wrist through there, bar in there, grip over the top like that. Yes, there are other varieties of lifting strap, but I've always found them a bit of a faff, and I've never enjoyed lifting heavy weights in lifting straps, so the easy on and off for me is a big sell. You can obviously use whatever you want, but if you have issues with grip and feel that grip is failing you on heavy dumbbell rows or heavy pull downs or something, then using a pair of these might be a good solution. But I would generally encourage people to try and train their grip strength through deadlifting and not use these. But if that is a limiting factor and you do need to use a pair of straps, then make sure you've got them in your bag. Otherwise, you're probably not gonna lift that heavy deadlift that you wanted to, are you? And finally, a lifting belt might be a fantastic investment as not only does it allow you to more effectively breathe into your stomach and brace against the lifting belt, therefore creating more tension in your trunk and allowing you to execute a tighter movement, therefore creating, in theory, more strength. But as I found out six years ago, they make a great chew toy for puppies as Odie decided to have at this one six years ago. But these take a little bit of breaking in because they're very stiff and rigid when you get them and they do take a bit of practice for you to feel like you're getting stronger in them but ultimately all it's doing is allowing you to create more tension in your trunk which will help you with positioning on deadlifting squatting or any other movements but generally i'd use them over a certain percentage that you get comfortable with and don't get completely used to wearing them all the time otherwise you might just fold under a heavy weight if you didn't have a belt on so those are the accessories that I would recommend from a lifting point of view. Let's cover a few miscellaneous recommendations before we close things off. Okay, so just a few miscellaneous things to close things off so that we can tie this all together. I use Whoop as a lifestyle tracker on a day-to-day -day basis to almost calibrate all of the inputs into my overall fatigue, my overall recovery, and my sleep tracking. So I use this to make informed decisions around my sleep, around my training, around my recovery habits so that I can get the best out of all of this kit, out of my programming and keep moving forwards. When ultimately, as hybrid athletes, we are not progressing at the rate that you can do if you were just training in each of these disciplines on its own. We're working at a limited capacity, which means we really need to over-index on the sleep, the nutrition, the programming, all the things that matter to help keep us moving forward. So I would recommend giving Whoop a go. And if you haven't yet done so, you can get your first month free through the link in the description down below. Secondly, I would recommend a bike fit, which isn't strictly speaking a bit of kit, but it is getting the best out of your kit. And that is whether your bike is worth 500 quid, $500, or 2,500 or 5,000 or 10,000, whatever it is, whatever bike you're on, you want to be comfortable and in the best position possible. So a little bit of spend will pay serious dividends in terms of positioning, programming, performance, and comfort ultimately, which I think is money well spent. So just something to consider so that you can get the best out of your kit rather than just having the kit in the first place. Next up, something I have rinsed over the summer is protective moisturizer for my face because I'm spending so much time outdoors. I found my skin's been getting really pissed off and dry and salty and horrible. So sticking some of this on before I go out on long rides or long runs has been very useful. If you'd like 40, 40% 40 off any Man Cave products, you can do so with this code here. And there is a link in the description down below for you to check them out. Other than that, and point number four, the only other thing I would recommend is a bigger form of transport, car or truck to deal with all this stuff because the admin travel planning around all of it is a bit of a pain in the arse. So I wonder why at this point any of you would want to be hybrid athletes because there is a lot of things to consider as we've aptly covered today. But on that, if any of you do want to become hybrid athletes and don't know where to begin, then please do reach out to us at Omnia Performance. Website is here, Instagram is here, and Johnny and I have coached hundreds, if not thousands of athletes at this point through their hybrid athletic goals. And we look forward to hearing from you potentially on what you would like to achieve as we have a whole load of products for total beginners up to elite athletes, special forces, military selection, whatever it might be that we would love to help you achieve. So if you are interested in looking at things from a programming point of view, then please do head to the top link in the description if you are interested in any coaching from myself or Johnny. And that's that. That is an overview of all the kit I use on a regular weekly basis, whether it's summer, whether it's winter. A lot of the things that you see here are the baseline and the foundation of everything that I use. A lot of the stuff I've had for years and years and years. A lot of the stuff is a bit newer, but it's still really, really part of my day to day. As I've said, I hope that the breakdown of the bare minimum and then the sort of nice to haves makes it clear for you what around your budget, around your ability makes sense to invest in. And therefore you can take the first step on hopefully 
what is going to be a very exciting journey of enjoying lots of different disciplines all at once. Because triathletes will tell you you shouldn't lift, lifters will tell you you shouldn't do triathlons, runners will tell you that you're too heavy to run, and people that are too heavy to run will tell you that runners are all skinny and there's no weight classes in the jungle. Bro! <laughs> But ultimately, if you enjoy doing all these things, do them. That's why I enjoy training like this. That's why I enjoy training others like this. And frankly, I don't care what others say. You do you, boo. And hopefully, this has informed you of all the kit that might be required if you are going to do you, boo. So please remember at this stage, if you have not yet done so, to like the video, make sure you hit subscribe down below and drop a comment with your thoughts, feelings, or how much spit I just spat out of my mouth onto my knee there if you saw that. And goodbye.